I'm Belle Morian. I'm our programming director, and we're delighted to have you here tonight, and we're really glad that it's not going to get rainy and stormy till later tonight. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to give you some updates on the museum happenings here. Um, for the past several months, our beautiful historic house has been undergoing an electrical transformation uh, from knob and tube wiring to current standards. And so the interior of a house hasn't been open for tours. So we're looking forward to having the house back open for our community in the fall. And we can't wait to have a bustling, vibrant museum again. Our SOAR Family Day in March brought about 700 attendees to the museum on a beautiful spring day. And it was so much fun. And we would like to thank all who participated, from artists to partnering nonprofits, and of course, our attendees. Our lecture series will conclude in May, on May 18th, with a sparkling presentation by Beth Wees. She's the curator emerita uh, from the American Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Beth lectures internationally, and her exhibit, Jewelry for America, was on view at the Met from 2019 to 2021. And as a special treat for our lecture guests, jewelry uh, that's connected to the history of this museum will be on display that evening. September will usher in our public programming for the fall, and we'll feature Jimmy Simmons' friend and friends as our um, featured artist for Music in the Gardens, which is so much fun. And we all love Jimmy, so we'll be happy to have him back. And um, as always, I'd like, and I'm guilty of this myself, I'd like to remind everybody to uh, turn your phones off so you can enjoy this special presentation. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our talented and accomplished executive director, Tony Chaveau. Thanks, Bill. I want to add my um, welcome to each of you for uh, this, our next to last lecture in the 2022-23 McFadden Ward House Lecture Series. And as always, I want to acknowledge the Mamie McFadden Ward Heritage Foundation and to the museum's board of directors whose generosity ensures that all of our programming here at uh, the McFadden Ward House is free and open to the public. Uh, we have... Uh, Two of our board members here, Martha Hicks is a member of our board. Thank you, Martha, for being here tonight, as well as um, Ida McFadden Powell, who is the Vice President Emeritus of the board. So thank you all for being here with us, and thank you for the generosity that you extend uh, to the museum. Introducing this evening's speaker, I could tell you that Ivan Schwartz has been a sculptor for over 50 years or almost 50 years, I should say, that he's been the uh, director of Studio ICE in Brooklyn, New York, and that his work is, found, that his work is found in some of the most historically significant uh, sites in the United States, and on and on. But words fail to, when attempting to convey to you the depth of Ivan Schwartz's talent, his dedication to his craft, and the remarkable body of work he has produced over the past few decades. They say that one picture is worth a thousand words. So here's an excerpt from the CBS 60 Minutes profile on Ivan, which offers much better than I can, great insight into Ivan Schwartz and his work. We see them everywhere, tributes to the men and women who played a role in our history. I'm Belle. Woo! We see new ones going up and old ones coming down. But sometimes we don't even think about the art behind the image. E-I-S, which stands for Elliot and Ivan Schwartz. And he is your brother. He is. Ivan Schwartz is a classically trained sculptor who turned his art into a business when he and his brother Elliot opened this Brooklyn, New York studio in 1977. We've done many Lincolns and Washingtons and now Frederick Douglass sculptures and Harriet Tubman. I often have to sit and think, well, how, where is this going to begin? From Anne Frank at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans and Abraham Lincoln seated at Gettysburg to all of the women represented at the Virginia Women's Monument, the work of Schwartz's team can be seen pretty much everywhere. 
There's that famous quote from <clears throat> Michelangelo or somebody, or you just chip away from the marble whatever, whatever does not look like the person. All oh, right. <laughs> Makes it sound so simple. It's not that simple. No, you have to think about what you want to do, um, and you have to think very hard, because what we're going to wind up with is a, um, an inanimate object. Schwartz works in a style similar to that of Michelangelo and many other great sculptors. He oversees the work of a team of skilled artists. These guys can do what I used to do way better than I ever could. It just begins with the vision. I leave the real world and enter a little fantasy world where I am thinking, what are you gonna do with this person who's been represented so many times before? A monumental hurdle for this particular commission, a sculpture of President John F. Kennedy, a new addition to the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in celebration of its 50th year, an undertaking funded by billionaire investor and philanthropist David Rubenstein. When you look at pictures of Kennedy, he was smiling. He was the great new president who was on television, and we saw him all the time. Young, handsome, and energetic, the public came to know his face, his gestures, long before he was immortalized by his assassination in 1963. So any physical representation of him had to be realistic. The client, in this case the Kennedy Center, the, all they told us was that they wanted something that was approachable. So we all sort of bang our heads together and then begin looking at the imagery. I would say I looked at 33,000 photographs and I looked at movies, videos of, of Kennedy. Deborah Schwartz is director of projects at the studio and sister to Ivan and Elliot. I went through everything about Kennedy, his jacket, his hair, his tie, his handkerchief in his pocket, his shoes, his socks, his cufflinks. Meticulous. Everything, very meticulous. And it is this measure of study and observation that makes Schwartz's statues particularly relatable. Now, none of us knew this, but as we started watching films, he would constantly touch his coat jacket button. And we almost begin to laugh every time we see it because, oh, look, there it is again. When the idea comes through, the crafting begins. From the clay foundation, making the mold and pouring the bronze, to the finishing touches. Each step of the process belongs to an artist. Not every day, but some days, we get to make sculptures of people who have meant something, who've done something, whose contribution to our lives, American life, has, has had meaning. And those people become symbols for future generations. President Kennedy's daughter, Caroline, echoed this in her remarks at the recent unveiling. I look forward to seeing how visitors experience President Kennedy's humanity when they experience this work of art. Now, Schwartz and his team can sit back and hope that this piece will be received in the way it was intended, a familiar representation of a man who meant so much to so many. Please welcome Ivan Schwartz. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I'm delighted to be here in Beaumont. Uh, Texas has become a kind of second home since uh, 2014. Uh, the, the archive of the studio, which is now, I don't know, in its 47th year maybe, um, was acquired by the Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas. And so I'm in Texas, probably aside from New York, uh, almost more than in any other state, and I enjoy coming here a great deal. Uh, Beaumont is a new experience, and I'm very happy to be here. And I want to thank Tony, and I want to thank Bell, and all the staff here at uh, McFadden Ward. I think that the first interesting thing that occurs to me with that wonderful introduction by Chip Reed is um, the journalistic, uh, I I the exaggeration or uh, which is the reason why when the, uh, the CBS uh, Sunday morning piece came out, 
I didn't really, I didn't watch it immediately. It came out on a Sunday and I said, I, I just can't, I'm not sure I can watch this thing. And you heard him make reference to Michelangelo twice. And if you do what I do, it, you just sort of shrink in horror because we're, we're not Michelangelo and obviously we appreciate what <laughs> Michelangelo did a great deal. So um, uh, I'm, gonna sh I'm gonna take you through how we do what we do. And, um, and, and then it's, if you've done it as long as I have, one of the interesting things about the, the making of this is, is that um, it was almost a completely dead art form. Uh, I have spent most of my life basically in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, living back in time with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and many other great Americans. Um, and there was certainly a time where I thought, you know, I don't, I don't know who wants this old-fashioned stuff, this, you know, park sculpture uh, that we make, and we managed to keep going. And of course, what's happened in the last, I'll say mostly in the last decade, I is that as a result of the issues that have, you know, absorbed many of us in, in communities all across the country, I is that we have been questioning who our past heroes have been. And as a result of that, um, it almost became more interesting about the question, the importance of these old-fashioned sculptures, which for the most part people passed every single day and pay, didn't pay too much attention to. And now we pay a great deal of attention to the making of these symbol images. So. I'm going to talk about symbols. First, I'm going to tell you about how we do what we do, and I'm going to ask you, you all some questions as you see it, see if you pick up any of the things that, that I have to look at as I'm studying the, my subjects. So, okay, here we go. Let's see. We see them everywhere. Oh, sorry. Let's see. No. We okay. see them. Okay. Uh, so we begin with how we, how we do this. And obviously, it begins with research and documentation. I think I'm just going to have to stand like this. Let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, so um, this is a forensic project we did with the National Museum of Natural History. We've done a number of projects with them. And before we do anything, we meet with the staff at the museum. Uh, and I can see by the material on the table that we're talking about uh, an individual that may have existed about 35,000 years ago. And obviously, you know, when somebody brings that information to me, I'm completely ignorant. I don't know anything about this person. Uh, you know, bones have been discovered somewhere, and, and then the scientists want to reconstruct this person. And so that's what's going on right here. And that leads to something quite interesting and obviously these projects, the, the imagery, when we turned over our images to the Briscoe Center, we turned over 100,000 images. So obviously this is a, an encapsulation briefly and it, run, it just jumps around a great deal. So stick with me and, and, and ask questions if I'm losing you. But um, what you see right here is um, uh, me uh, measuring Thomas Jefferson's clothing at um, Monticello. And so um, uh, years ago, we, we did a project for the National Museum in Washington, and it involved measuring some of Lincoln's clothing. And I thought, you know, would anyone turn down the opportunity to actually be in the same room with some of these essential artifacts of American history? And the answer is no. And so whenever the opportunity arises, to actually stand in the room to measure George Washington's clothing or Lincoln's clothing or Louis Armstrong's clothing for that matter, I, I say absolutely. So this is at uh, Monticello. And um, this is my first question to all of you. Um, this is Thomas Jefferson's clothing. Um, after he left office, he died in 1826. And um, Monticello has since been rebuilt, but I was astonished to see that they just kept Jefferson's clothing in some archival boxes in, in a room that wasn't really particularly suited, and the, and the boxes were open, and there, there was Thomas Jefferson. So the first question, in a way, to all of you is, do you notice anything 
if you can think about what Jefferson looked like, let's say, at the Jefferson Memorial, is there anything that strikes you about the coat on the right? Exactly. Uh, well, actually, they weren't, small, they weren't necessarily smaller because the average height of the, of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution um, were 5 foot 10. And um, I, I lost about $50,000 uh, because when we started the project, like some of you, I thought the signers of the Constitution were probably about five foot two. When you go to the foundry to say, well, how much is this going to cost? It's based on a kind of guess. So I, when the foundry said, how tall are they? Because, you know, it's about bronze ingots. I said they were five foot two. Uh, well, when they came out to be five foot ten, that was an extra $50,000. In any case, the only point is that when we talk about symbols and then you look at the real artifact, Thomas Jefferson was six foot two. He was a really rangy guy. He was very, very skinny. He, his shoulders are about this narrow. But if you go to the Jefferson Memorial, which really was late in terms of the great memorials in Washington, D.C., what you're going to see is the continuation of the 19th century proposition, and that was the, the founding generation, they were our heroes, and they were not going to re represent Jefferson the way he really was. And so Jefferson, Washington, James Madison was a pretty small guy, but uh, they're all aggrandized in the representation right through the 19th century, right into the 20th century. So when I came along and it was time for me to do what I have done for now almost five decades, and so many of these people had been represented before, the question I had to ask myself was, is there anything new that I'm going to bring to this uh, representation? And the answer is no, except to represent them as naturalistically as possible. And so that's my proposition. That's what I do. So this is one of the great iconic um, artifacts in American culture. Um, and when invited to measure Lincoln's hat, um, I was invited to the National Museum of American History. We were making a sculpture of Abraham Lincoln for, it's now called President Lincoln's Cottage, where he spent um, most of his summers about three miles outside of, of what is now downtown D.C. Um, the opportunity came to measure his clothing and measure the hat. And that white foam core boxes on the table, there were three of us in the room, and I was... Uh, I was very excited to, to be that close to this artifact. You know, this wasn't going to be Disneyland. This is the real thing. And the curator turned to us and said, now, now listen, don't breathe when I open the box. And I thought, well, I, you know, why? Because it's so exciting. You know, you're just not going to, you're going to have goosebumps. Well, he opened the box, and this is what we saw. And then I was waiting for the, how come we're not allowed to breathe? He said, well, now I'm going to tell you the hat is dusted in arsenic. Uh, uh, because it's a beaver skin hat and, uh, and, it, and arsenic kills the mold. So we're all still here. We didn't breathe, breathe in too much arsenic. But this is one of the great moments. I mean, being alone with these objects, you really sort of ask yourself about who these people have been and what their contribution has been. I mean, I'm not a historian, but um, I have pretty great powers of visual observation. So to be there was really a very important thing for me. We also measured his clothing. Um, his, his, the clothing that he died in um, are at, at, the, uh, at Ford's Theater. It, there's a collection there. And so all of these measurements were made in cooperation with Ford's Theater. Um, once, you know, a, somebody comes to us with a proposition they'd like to they'd like to do this project you know the first thing is well what are we going to do what's the narrative these sculptures don't move uh, and as I said it's a pretty old-fashioned proposition about how they get made and so it begins as you see with a lot of different people by the time we're finished with a project at least 20 or 25 people have touched every single sculpture from people who make drawings and photographers, sculptors, people, men and women who work in foundries. So it is a huge collaborative effort. It doesn't happen by, as a result of one person. All the work that I have done for all of these decades could never have been accomplished by me alone. 
And I understood that because the first few proje projects I did only with one other helper. And it, it nearly kills you. There's just so much work to do as a, as a proposition, as a way forward in life. You just know it's the worst financial model that you could ever possibly uh, uh, take on. And also it's very heavy lifting. So it takes a lot of people to do this thing. And so what you see here, we're designing the, um, the Lincoln sculpture um, at the National Military Cemetery at Gettysburg. And we, f for the folks at Gettysburg, and that was partially a National Park Service project, we made a lot of images because um, a lot of the design is what I call design by rejection. People don't really know what they want, so you give people a lot of choices, and invariably they'll tell you immediately what they don't like, um, and then it's harder to figure out what, what suits their purpose. And so using, you know, it's, it's a kind of multiple choice um, question, how you get where you're going. Uh, and this was the, the final drawing before we then started making models and make the full-scale sculpture. Uh, this is a page from the Virginia Women's Monument. So sometimes the preparation, I mean, this was a 150-page book. And it took almost 10 years to complete this project. And you'll see some pictures of that later. Um, once we have a narrative, there's a story, and everybody agrees, um, then you have to illustrate it somehow. So sometimes it's done, if there's a singular figure, it's done w by drawing. Um, and often that happens, I would say, in the world of pre-photography in the 18th century. Once we, photography, became technically uh, um, uh, a, as an innovation was about 1839 and so you uh, Abraham Lincoln was not the first president to be photographed but he was photographed copiously he sat for the camera 63 times there there exists today about 130 photographs of Lincoln so why start from scratch when you have all of these images and you can derive uh, es the essential person from a lot of those photographs uh, as opposed to drawing, which is kind of, um, I wouldn't say archaic, I love to draw, but the photographic material really kind of gives you greater insight. So when you're talking about George Washington, you know, we have partial view images from a lot of paintings and some sculptures, and, and in that case it's important to sort of illustrate in other ways. Uh, this is so the beginning of the Virginia Women's Monument. And then what had to happen um, was a full-scale photo shoot um, with uh, all, there were 12 sculptures, 12 bronze sculptures on the, um, the, the, at the state capitol in Richmond. And so this is a mock-up that took place in the studio about, I'd say about five or six years ago. Um, so we had, we hire actors. Um, and we, we have costumers and historians, and the clients are there. And on this page, you can see the preparation um, after we'd photographed people, um, went into a book, preparation for presentation, for making choices about poses. And what you see here is the photo shoot. Um, how do we arrive at what these, you know, once they're in bronze, we can't change them. So you really want to, everybody's got to be sure about what we're going to be doing here. So uh, this took about five days, and we probably shot about 1,500 images, and then you have to begin the editing process. Uh, we hired a Broadway director. I, I didn't want to be involved in trying to direct the individuals. I wanted to sort of stand back and see what somebody else who had directorial skills could do with, with the overall narrative. So the guy in the orange shirt is a guy who's directed a lot of Broadway uh, musicals. Um, so now we can, we're going to jump back to um, the uh, 21 years ago, um, the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, which was the largest bronze project uh, of its type in American history. There are 42 bronze sculptures in one room. So there were th 39 signers and three dissenters uh, uh, who signed and didn't sign the Constitution. And uh, our job was to create the, uh, the map of how you do this. Um, and so what you see are um, there were models, models, and models, and actors. 
we went to Chinatown, we bought sort of Chinese, um, uh, I, I call them pajamas, and we had to put a ruff on, so they're all wearing the same thing, and, and then for days we did the same thing and shot, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs. And then the editing process begins. So what you see here is just an outtake from one of the, you know, many, many pages of, um, you know, images of the thousands of images or hundreds of images used to decide, you know, how are we going to stage this thing? Um, uh, when we see, you're going to see some pictures later and even a small uh, short film. The interesting thing about this project was so this was uh, 21 years ago, and I really thought we'd sort of done it all. And I was getting tired of doing this. I'd already done it for a long time. And um, when it was a, a national competition, which we won, and I turned to my brother and I said, you know, who wants this thing? You know, who wants this old-fashioned thing? Who's going to stand and look at this thing? You know, we're already into home computing and... Um, you know, we're talking about attention spans that are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I just really questioned why anybody would want to buy this thing, because it's not, it's not cheap to do this. And you'll see what happens later. But I was not convinced. Of course, we did it. And in the middle of it, from our studio window, you could see the World Trade Center towers falling. And so that, that's, a, and you know, I'll never forget the moment when this is all happening. And a lot of the sculptors, um, many of them were foreign born. Uh, they sort of, they came and lived at the studio for a while. Doing this work gave them great uh, solace because uh, it went on for two and a half years. Now let's see if I can get this to play. Uh oh, sorry. Ah, okay. Ah. Uh, so this is very early digital uh, filming, but you'll get the idea. So this is the reason why we still do it. It's, it's, you know, I just would never have thought, you know, I thought I'm a smart guy. No, nobody wants this thing. But actually, it's just the opposite. If you do a great job, people want, do enjoy. And, of course, the hope is um, that they, everybody goes to their iPhones and computers. And, and uh, American history is so important. Um, I think there are so many lessons that we need to take away and if, if your kids go in to the Virginia Women's Monument or the National Constitution Center uh, or coming um, in three years, we're doing a project at the Alamo, um, there's great value in the thing that we do and obviously the thing that we'll leave behind. So this is what it looks like. We were doing a big project for the, um, the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. And, you know, when it's really hopping in the studio, it's just full up with, you know, these figures that we're making and lots and lots of people. You know, there's somewhere between 10 and 20 people who are working in the studio. And this, so th this is another, you know, sort of uh, masterpiece theater uh, dress up for the preparation for this project. Um, one of the many Lincolns for the, uh, this one was for the New York Historical Society. And of course there are, there are reenactors and they're an interesting group because they actually sort of think they are the person. Uh, and uh, we're, doing an Einstein, we're doing an Einstein sculpture for the Center for Advanced Study where Einstein taught in Princeton. And we're flying a guy in from Louisville who pretty much not only does he live as Einstein, but if you call him on the phone, he, he's, he answers the phone like Einstein. So they're a kind of an odd bunch, but they help us to illustrate what we're doing. Um, 
So this is, look, this, is, this one, this is right here. This is down home. Um, when we learned about the Alamo project and we were thinking, well, you know, how are we going to do this? We're, um, the folks who have done the, the, uh, the Alamo Foundation and all the historians associated with the history that will drive this project are going to be representing 300 years of Texas history. Well, you know, Texas history has, um, we have done some projects here in Texas, but, you know, they tend to be so, sort of more Northeast-centric or California. So I'm not especially well-versed in Texas history, although, you know, I'm catching up. And so we decided to do a sort of test with um, some costume folks, and this is how we do it. Um, Maestro? Right, we'll put somebody on a sort of lazy Susan and, and we'll shoot photos, 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 photos because sculptors need thing, images to work from. We, Virginia, we went back to the Virginia Women's Monument, we had to make a model um, which is now in the archive of, of the, uh, the Virginia State Capitol. And then what I call the wrestling match. You know, once you've done all this preliminary work, which can ta easily take six months. I mean, I think on the Alamo project, I, I can't imagine we'll start doing any work for at least six or eight months. Um, because the thing about it is you have to get it right. There is no point in doing this thing unless you get it right. And since much of it depends upon an understanding of, an acute understanding of costume history and also just who were the people we're talking about. It takes a very, very long time to get to the bottom of, of all of that information. So I don't think we'll be really starting for a very long time. And this is what it looks like when sculptors are sculpting in clay. So this could easily have been in the 19th century or the 18th century because we have fluorescent lights and computers. Um, but the process is still very much the same. Uh, this is... Um, in process, we made a uh, Teddy Roosevelt for the um, American Museum of Natural History. And on this day, there's a woman you see who's sort of pointing her index finger. For months, all of those other people had been coming to the studio. This great phalanx of vice presidents from the museum were coming once a week to say, yes, that's the pose. That's great. Keep doing it. And uh, Deborah Futter, who's there in the middle, was invited as we were getting close to the finish and she arrived and they were all the other guys and were taking out their cameras they were so proud of themselves and and Deborah could be heard saying that's not my Teddy Roosevelt and so um, in the annals of making objects you know things go sideways and and you know you're struck in that moment by you know how could this happen and at the same time, you know, you've got to do something on the spot. So we had to cut off one arm and quickly sort of reassemble it. Obviously, we couldn't finish it, but we were able to satisfy her. Um, and the, the, Ill, the ill will <laughs> continued on for, for some time. And happily, she's not there anymore. But the sculpture turned out just fine. <laughs> it happens. Um, and obviously, you know, in, so the, the sculptures are created essentially in two parts. You sculpt the body of somebody, and then there are specialists. There are people who make portraits, the face and the head. And um, we bring people in from all over the world who really are the, the best who can do this. Um, we had somebody who was at the studio, an Italian sculptor who was living in New York for six months, who we brought into um, uh, to the studio. Um, we're bringing an, another, an Englishman in and helping him get his visa. Uh, the talent, I mean, there's a shortage of people who can do almost everything. Uh, there's a labor shortage throughout the country, and, and we're, um, we're vulnerable to the same thing. So when need be, um, there are plenty of people all over the world who do it. It makes our job much more difficult, but that's, you do what you have to do. Uh, you know, this is what it looks like as, you know, a, a, a master sculptor would be working on, I think this was the, sculpt, the portrait um, for the um, Gettysburg Lincoln. 
it's a sort of quiet and lonely working existence in a way with exactitude but there is also you know it's essential that you are able to conjure the essence of people um, and um, you know I often begin one of these projects by um, by saying you know what would it have been like to be with Lincoln or Washington in a room alone would I have been able to sense something about that those people that I could then sort of make a part of the sculpture that we were making and I think that's where those powers of observation become essential it is not only the visual reference it is something that you take away from any individual uh, this is the beginning of the Kennedy sculpture you can see the model on the right I think he was about the final sculpture was about seven feet tall uh, it was Yo-Yo Ma, the great cellist, was there for the dedication, and it, it was a very tough, uh, as as portrait sculptures go, this was a very difficult one. Um, obviously, I was alive when Kennedy was in office, but I didn't have, aside from the tragedy, I didn't have any great feeling about Kennedy the way I had perhaps about Lincoln or Washington. Kennedy was in office so briefly that it was difficult for me to sort of conjure what his great accomplishment might be as it translated into the physical representation. And, you know, what we came down to was that Kennedy was telegenic, he was incredibly energetic, he was very handsome, and then there was that funny tick where he was always sort of playing with his button. And I was surprised, but the Kennedy Center sort of went with that. Uh, uh, but it was something that actually made him unique. And when you look at the films, you see him doing this all the time. It has no great significance except that he did it. Uh, this was the clay sculpture for um, the Virginia Capitol, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. More clay sculptures. Um, we made a Louis Armstrong sculpture for National Harbor in Washington. It was a large project. And um, it, it was great because, you know, getting away from the American presidency, getting away from our conventional heroes briefly was, a, for me, was a, a, a great respite. I love music and, and even on the surface of the sculpture we could take some more liberty. Uh, this is one, one of my favorite clay sculptures. I didn't like the finished piece quite as much. Uh, Frederick Douglass, this is at the New York Historical Society with Lincoln. Uh, I just love the rendering. It's sort of amazing that you can make in clay this dense, heavy material. You could actually make it look like it's fabric. Uh, James and Dolly Madison um, for Madison's home. And uh, Lincoln and his horse at, the, um, um, at President Lincoln's cottage. There was a lot of anecdotal information about Lincoln coming and going, uh, riding on his horse, from the cottage three miles down to the White House, which is sort of unthinkable, obviously, today. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, late in life after he'd left the presidency, a clay portrait. And then uh, once the work has been approved, now we begin the reproduction process. So what most people don't realize is you have to ha actually make the sculpture three times. The first time is where all the art takes place the, the prototype sculpture, the second time, which is what you see happening here, we're making a mold, and, and from this mold, uh, finished mold, um, then what you see is a wax sculpture. So we're talking about a lost wax process, which is about 5,000 years old, invented by the Chinese. And um, essentially what you have is a casting that comes out of that mold, which is cast hollow. You can see where his arms are cut off. There's a void there. And the inside of the sculpture is completely filled with sort of concrete-like material and then surrounded on the outside with the same material. And you can see those pins at the bottom. So the pins pin the outside to the inside and, and keeps the wax in place. And then it all goes into a furnace and the wax is melted out. And where the wax is melted out, that's where the bronze goes in, and that's how the sculpture is made. Now, I can tell you almost nobody understands that unless you actually see it happening. Uh, this is the largest 
art foundry in America, which is about 90 miles north of New York City. And today, you know, if you were involved in the art world, you would see lots of work, lots of work by very famous artists from all over the world being made here. And this is only half of the place. We work with five different foundries around the country. And, you know, depending upon their schedule and how much work we have. Um, but this is a great place for us, and we've been working here for about 30 years. And so this is, you know, this is the thrilling part, right? 1,800 degrees of molten metal being poured into those molds. And um, that, you know, back at the foundry, um, and here you, what you see here are the, some of the, the Virginia women's sculptures. They're, they're not made in one piece. They're made in numerous pieces. And part of the art of the, the foundry is to co-join those pieces. And then where, where all the seams were, you have to work on in the metal on the surface to make it look as if the, it, was always, it had always been made in one piece. So bronze is just an alloy of a number of different metals that ultimately is quite soft. And foundry men uh, for centuries would work in tools and beat the surface. They could elevate it. They could close holes. They could do all of it with hand tools. Now it's all done pneumatically. Um, but it's a huge skill set. And it, at the end of the day, when the sculpture is finished, um, you're, you're not meant to see any of the seams or any of the imperfections. Uh, this is a project we did in Morristown, New Jersey. And these are, these particular bronze sculptures are, this is just before they're going to receive their final patination. They've been sandblasted. So in, in case you didn't know, this is sort of what bronze looks like. It looks more like brass. Um, uh, you, you know, our, our notion of bronze is what you see out on, you know, in the monument. But actually, this is what the raw material looks like. And, and the, this is how we decide on how we're going to, what color we're going to make it in the end. Uh, this is one of our sculptures. Um, this woman was um, the first woman and an African American to own a bank in America. And, um, and it was in Richmond, Virginia uh, in the 1930s, which is really an extraordinary thing. And then, of course, uh, things arrive, and this is what happens on the site. <laughs> if only it could happen that quickly. And, and, and now I'm going to just show you a couple of other pictures. Then we're going to move into the, into the bigger questions. Uh, we made this guy, the Empire State Building built a museum, and we made some figures about the making of the Empire State Building. Uh, this was the Frederick Douglass sculpture at New York Historical. Uh, James and Dolly Madison, who I think maybe you saw in clay. Um, and this is at the North Carolina Museum of History. And this is the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, those guys who were all sort of brass, like earlier, a few shots earlier, uh, Washington, and Hamilton and the Marquis de Lafayette. This is that sculpture finished. And this was the, uh, you know, for me, this is, you know, what I would call the money shot in a way. This is the National Constitution Center, uh, the, the completed project. And this, this one photograph, this is the one. I only ever saw the room when we had finished the installation and I left. We'd worked on it for two years. I came back to New York. I said, look, it's a great project, but I'm still going to say the same thing. I don't know who wants this thing. And then my brother went down to photograph it, and this is what he came back with. And that was it. And that sort of redoubled my effort, which is why now, another 20 years on, I still have this passion for this thing that we do. It, it, it is a fantastic collaborative thing. For anyone who has worked collaboratively in anything, you know you can get so much more done if people speak in one voice and you have goals that actually matter. On some days, the thing you do matters a great deal. That was the finished uh, Roosevelt. And we, we are 
actually completing years of work for the World War II Museum in New Orleans, if you get there. We've done a lot of work there. Uh, this is an Einstein at the Griffith Observatory in um, California. And this was the completed Virginia Women's Monument. So this is, um, uh, I'll just pause for a second on the technical business. I gave a talk at the dedication for this project and that was, it was in 2019. And what was obvious to me was that our symbols, our American symbols, they were changing. A and, you know, that was the, the essence of how could you dedicate a monument to 400 years of Virginia women or the history of Virginia women without talking about the fact that for 400 years they'd basically been denied the same pedestal that men had been or that African Americans had been, or Native Americans. And so this is really the big change in America. What had been a kind of status quo, we celebrate great people, uh, but they are the people of our time. And so if we go back to the 19th century, the people that we, we might have thought about as being our great military leaders or our great politicians, our attitudes change. And I think that goes, with, that's par for the course. Our uh, history shines a light on, on the past. And we know more about, we know more about George Washington today than somebody that would have lived within 10 years of his death in 1799. And so it, it, it's fair to make reassessments. And it's really, really obvious. It became very obvious to me in 2014 when we shipped off all of our material to the University of Texas that we had almost no women in the representation of all of the work that we had done thus far. And it was, uh, it was a bit shocking, to be honest. And so that's changed now. A and I think, um, obviously, this is a big contentious issue in America. Um, the idea of revisiting what we do is an important idea. We should always think about who, we're, what we're representing and for what reason. These symbols matter a great deal. Um, they translate into useful purpose for future generations. So this was a moment, this is only four years ago, where I was able to stand up and so was the governor of Virginia and say, look, this is a, a seminal moment where the people we celebrate as being important to our collective American culture, whatever state you live in, it's changing. And it seems like a, a good idea to me. Um, OK, the Kennedy unveiling. What is a living memorial? What is worth remembering? Knowledge of history makes us empathetic to the present and connects us to the actions that affect our future. This weekend is an annual opportunity for self-reflection as the artists we honor and those that perform reflect our culture back to us. I look forward to seeing how visitors experience President Kennedy's humanity when they experience this work of art. In the short time he was on this earth, he managed to do more to inspire people in my generation than anybody else that I know of. To this day, President Kennedy's words guide my values and actions as a citizen. They make me want to make sure the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts will always be a living memorial to his words, deeds, and ideals for generations to come. I mean, I have to say, when that was finished, it was a huge relief. Uh, because as I was saying before, I mean, the thing about Kennedy was, you know, uh, they, they, in the beginning, they wanted us to make Jackie Kennedy as well. 
And I really was very nervous about that because um, the representation of Jackie Kennedy would have been a great, about a great deal of artifice, hair, makeup, certain things. They're not structural. Um, but, but when you see photographs of Jackie, those are things, her clothing, her hair, her makeup, Etc. Those are things that were part of the representation. Those are not things that we can easily use when you're making sculptures. John Kennedy was a little bit, he was similar in a way. We looked at films and films and photographs um, and we kept seeing the same thing over and over again. He was a very handsome guy, but you know, we, we, we just weren't, um, uh, I guess we just weren't moved in the same way that we were moved by Lincoln or some other um, previous presidents. And, and also, his family was still there, and they were a part of the decision-making process. So it was really, as a project, it, it was especially fraught. And, and in the end, I'm very, very pleased, but it was tough to get through projects like that. Uh, so right now, um, the Alamo project is just beginning, and, and f we won't know much more for months. But we are working on a major monument right now in Oklahoma City. Uh, 1958, 13 young uh, African-American kids sat in a at Katz's uh, drugstore uh, after having taken a trip to New York City where, for the first time, they were able to have a meal at a, a mixed lunch counter. They came back to Oklahoma City. Uh, Clara Looper was their mother and teacher. And unbeknownst to Clara, on one day, her daughter, Marilyn Looper, who was then 10, said, we're going to go and sit in at Katz's. They were all part of uh, young uh, people's um, NAACP uh, you know, chapter. And they took it upon themselves to do this. This is two years before Greensboro. So this is an event that is really largely unknown in America today. And Marilyn Looper is one of 10 others. Marilyn's now in her late 70s. And so uh, 11 of the 13 are still living. And we have been working with that group for the last year and a half. And this monument will be dedicated in about another year from now. So that was the scene on August the 19th, 1958. Almost no cameras there, no television cameras, because nobody knew this was about to happen. Um, and also the press didn't really, they didn't want to cover this. Uh, you know, they wanted it to appear as if Oklahoma, everything was okay in Oklahoma City in terms of race. And for the most part, and maybe because they were so young, there, there was not any terrible, terrible trouble. And over the next two years, they desegregated all the lunch counters in Oklahoma, which was an amazing thing. And so <clears throat> these are the sculptures that we're currently at work on. They're in clay. They're not in bronze. Um, and we're, we are making those 13 individuals. This is what it looks like today. And the, count, the counter and, you know, the, the menus from 1958 and the Coke glasses and the snow cone machine and everything. And again, it was, um, I, I thought, I'm not so sure I want to do all this realism. You know, it's, maybe it's not the right thing. But actually, I think it's so realistic in a way that it will be extremely compelling when you see this for all of the detail that has been sort of brought to bear in this sculpture that you know we've been now working on for the last year and a half. Everything, yep. And and as the mayor of Oklahoma City said, you know, years ago this would have been put into the black neighborhood. You know, they would have done this and put it right back in the black neighborhood to, as a kind of payback. And today this is going smack dab that in the middle of downtown. So some things change. Um, you know, we right certain wrongs, uh, everything, it, we haven't fixed everything, obviously, but the, these signify in terms of symbols that matter to us. People spend their money and they invest in them and they get behind these projects because they want to create these symbols for the time that we are living in. And, and I'm very um, honored to be a part of these projects. Um, 
So the last little bit, if you can hang in there for a few more minutes. Um, in 2014, I was invited to speak at the LBJ Library on a similar subject and all the work that I had done. And I thought, once again, I just, you know, it's not that I underplay the thing that I do, but when you do this, you just keep working. You don't really sort of wait for accolades and, you know, you just keep working and, and do the next project and do the next project. And so uh, I thought, you know, everybody's going to fall asleep when this, this lecture happens, talking about this thing. And so I thought, I need to get people off their seats. And it, it, 2014 was a particularly hot and heavy year for uh, prior to the death of George Floyd, which was probably, you know, the sort of pinnacle of statue removal. It was happening in 2014, and it had happened um, – you know, there was a Jefferson Davis sculpture on the campus of UT that was always being, um, you know, washed with white paint and red paint, and eventually the sculpture was moved to a museum setting. Um, it, that sculpture is now the the um, what the the chancellor of the University of Texas said. Look, we got to do something about this because we can't keep cleaning the sculpture, and obviously people just it's going to go on. It's never going to stop. So um, Don Carlton, who's the director of the Briscoe Center for American History, said, I'll take the Jefferson Davis sculpture, we'll put it inside, and we'll build an exhibit around the historical context. And I would say that that's probably where things are at in ter as a standard now for the removal of things where people can agree, yes, maybe they should come down, maybe not, but we're not going to trash them. And if we put them in storage forever, that's as good as getting rid of them forever, erasing them. So we build exhibitions around them and build a different historical context. So this little film was made basically to get people to wake up before the conversation because this is a very lively conversation. Um, I gave a, a, another talk at the LBJ Library two months ago and, and everybody that came up to me, all they really wanted to talk about were statues coming down. And, you know, I feel sort of on the back foot because I don't have all the answers, but I have certainly seen a lot. Okay. I'm going to stop this once. Just, oh, I'll go back. In this country, we use that phrase, lest we forget. Uh, I mean, everybody's familiar with that. But in my view, it's used so frequently, it's, it's lest we forget so we don't have to remember. We put so many statues and monuments up, but it's almost as if we put them up so we can remember, as, uh, we can forget as quickly as possible. So the phrase for me is now overused and has outlived its usefulness, but when I was making this thing, I thought, you know, okay, lest we forget, and it's statues of limitation, not statutes.
I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. the end folks I uh, I thank you uh, I, I if we have time I, I would love to take questions uh, I you know when I do this uh, my I feel as if uh, the last time I talked about it uh, or rather this time I missed some of the things I talked about last time um, for example, in the film you saw, there was a statue, a gold statue of King George III. And, and we made that statue uh, for the Museum of the American Revolution, a copy of it. It's an amazing story. You know, nine days after the Declaration of Independence was signed, the Sons of Liberty threw ropes around it. It's in, it, it was at the Battery in, in Manhattan, up on a big pedestal. They pulled it down. It was made out of lead. They tore it apart. They put the lead on barges. They sent the barges up to Connecticut, and they melted the, um, uh, all the lead down into bullets and then fired them back at the king's troops. So, you know, the, ir the irony, of course, is not lost on anyone. I mean, um, but so in the making, I mean, you know, for me, um, there's something amazing about having done this for so long because... Um, obviously, it fulfills something in me because I've, I've traveled a great deal and I, I, I sort of approach it as an empty vessel. If somebody has a project and they want to do something, I have to learn something about the project. I really didn't know anything about the tearing down of King George. And it has been an amazing experience for all of these decades and, and I, I still love the challenges. So. Uh, I would be very happy to take any questions on, on most subjects, if not all, uh, if you got some. Sure. Um, actually, I have not turned. Um, I was asked to do a, a, a project recently of a, a very famous drummer by the name of Neil Peart, um, an, an absolutely astonishing man. Um, and we just couldn't get the project in gear. Uh, he died two years ago, and his wife wanted to organize it. But, but it wasn't, there was no particular um, reason other than the fact that we just couldn't get the thing started. I mean, some projects have backfired because uh, directors of museums have embezzled the funds and gone to federal prison. <laughs> uh, you know, so things do happen, but um, I, I mean, maybe at this stage of my career, uh, only because you can see it's very, very busy, I just don't know how much more I can keep doing. Um, and 50 years seems, a, you know, like a, a goodly amount of time to have devoted to it. But no, there's nothing, um, I would think about, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't sure that the Alamo project was one that we could take on. I'm aware of, I'm aware peripherally of um, concerns about the history that drives the project. And so as a person who takes on the project, who then becomes the lightning rod 
for, you know, because we will have made those images. Um, it's not so much that I couldn't withstand, you know, whatever comes my way, but it's not really what I want to do is be in the middle of it. We made a, after 9-11, we were commissioned to make the Firefighters Memorial in New York City. And there were 434 firefighters who died on that day. And the fire chiefs, and it was all based on one um, photograph taken by a guy who worked at a local New Jersey paper of the three white Irishmen hoisting the flag, which was hugely important in that moment. But when we went to make this bronze sculpture, I, I went to see the fire chiefs in New York. I said, in 50 years, are you going to represent only the white guys who died on 9-11? On what about everybody else? What about the women? What about the, uh, what about the African Americans or the Hispanic people? And they said, okay, we'll have one white guy, one Hispanic, and one black guy. So that's what we did. And the, uh, Rudy Giuliani was about to leave office. Uh, I mean, within days. We worked so quickly that we'd finished the clay sculpture. It was a big event. Everybody loved it. And then about a week later, my, I had been away for the dedication. And, I, and email was, you know, we, we were on email at that time. I started to receive hundreds and hundreds of emails and massive amounts of hate mail. Um, there, there were people who thought, you know, this was revisionist history, changing the image that, you know, it was based on. But at, at the, even today, the New York City Fire Department is about 80% white. The police department is, is much, uh, the, the, the statistics on integration in the police department are, are, are much different. Um, and, and it's been a kind of, um, uh, the, the fire department orchestrated a campaign to basically kill the statue, which they did. And, you know, the story went around the world, and we were just beaten to a pulp. You know, uh, I, I did a few interviews, but it, you, every single time you get in front of a camera or get on the radio, you just get backed into the corner. Why would you do this? Why would you do it? Well, you know, if you lived in the place where all those people died, you would have done anything for the, for the memory of those people. So, you know, being on the wrong side for whatever reason is no fun. And at this stage, I'd rather not be there. But on the other hand, I, from everything that I understand, I think the Alamo Project is going to be a better representation today than it, it would have been when we were all watching Davy Crockett on TV. So I, I think that's, um, you know, I mean, that's my answer. Yeah. It's going to represent 300 years of Texas history. But I, well, there's, uh, there's an indigenous period, you know, before any of us got here. Um, uh, it, it represents the missionary period. It represents the, the um, Texas War of Independence. Um, and then it goes on from there. Um, there's a, a very small, it goes right up to the 1960s, so there's a tiny piece on civil rights. but. You know, I mean, it's probably far-reaching in that it tries to do too much, in my opinion, in, in terms of representation. But there will be 22 sculptures. So it's a big project. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, actually, it's just the reverse. Taking it away, taking it away would be carving in stone. It would be reductive. Ad and so this is additive. You make a kind of armature, and then you add small pieces, small pieces, small pieces. And then you essentially you sculpt it into the image that you're looking for. So somewhat different. Yeah. Sir. Uh, the name is familiar, but I can't say that. Yep. Right. <coughs> I do. 
uh, but I don't, I don't sign it with my name. I sign it with the studio name I, because of the collaboration on the heel. In other words, it's there just as a kind of to identify the artifact, but we don't need to really shout too loud. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, again, happily, it wasn't my decision. <laughs> there was, well, I say that only because, the, the, so these are really contentious issues, who's in and who's out. And the Library of Virginia took the responsibility, and they did the right thing. They surveyed the entire state for two years. They traveled to every single county in Virginia, and they had town halls, and they took votes, and they came up with names, and then there was a commission, and in the end, they narrowed it down to 50 names, and 50 became 12. Yeah. Yes. I don't. Um, uh, the, I, I, no, I don't. I know about the making of the, that sculpture. I, I do know about that, but I, I don't know anything about the, what should we say, overt symbolism that. W No, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I know that underneath the platform that Lincoln is sitting on, there have always been artifacts, and, and they're about to, they're turning that into a museum right now. So there's more, more to come at the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> right. Right. How do you do it? Yeah. With with great care. <laughs> right. That's what that's what you're supposed to do. Once a year, you're supposed to clean it and wax it. I mean, basically. I mean, if you, you know, go, go to Italy, you know, you'll see statues that have been out there for a thousand years. You know, they will last. But if you don't take care of them, because the, um, the alloys and the metal are subject to acid rain, for example. So, you know, eventually it'll deteriorate. You'll get holes in the bronze, and, and, then, and then it becomes a much bigger deal to fix them. Yeah. One more? Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, absolutely. I mean, in the beginning, you know, I, I sort of go, my, my father was born in 1912, and he was a working man, and he, you know, he came back from the war, and he said, well, I just sort of fell into the thing I wound up doing. And so, you know, I went to school, I studied, I had a classical background studying sculpture, I then spent a year in Italy. When I came back, I needed to earn a living. So when somebody asked me if I would do this commission, I said, sure, surprised when I won, Never thought I would do another one, and all these years later it goes on and on and on. So in the beginning it's sort of, hey, isn't this amazing? We're, we're doing the next one and the next one and the next one. And, and so, you know, for the most part, it really had to do with can we continue? Can we, how can we do, just keep going? I'll just finish with this one little funny story. In, in 81 we did our first big project. Actually, it's, um, it, that project is for the Center of Transportation in Galveston. So I think there were 39 sculptures. They weren't bronze, and they were for interior um, exhibition. 
And my brother and I looked at each other. You know, we'd, we'd do a couple of sculptures, and then we would be out of business. We'd have to pack up the studio, and, you know, and then when another project came along a year later, we'd have to rent another studio and get the tools and do all that. So this is 1981, and there were 39 sculptures. And the two of us looked at each other, and we said, we're going to be rich. <laughs> and so we decided to go and speak to, imagine we had an accountant. We, we went to speak to our accountant, and we said, we're going to be rich. And he said, I'll tell you what, boys, go make the money first and then come back and see me. <laughs> so, so things don't exactly work the way you think they do. But, um, you know, the early days were catch as catch can, I would say. But there were some great things we did and crazy things. Um, and, and we're still at it, so that's a good thing. Well, listen, thank you all very much for coming this evening. And I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. We want to give you, uh, as a token of our appreciation, um, this book, Folk Masters, A Portrait of Ameri uh, America. And uh, these are the great um, uh, folk and traditional artists uh, of, of the United States. And Thank um, you. you might could use that for a little research one day. Thank you, very much. So Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, and please uh, be with us at our next lecture, um, which is the last lecture of the, of the series on American jewelry. Thank you so much.